You are listening to Comfort in Chaos, Peace to the Troubled Heart, written by Eric Gilmore, read by Chloe Elmore, copyright Sunship International, produced by Chloe Voices. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. John 14 verse 1. Those whose hearts are tossed and troubled display nothing of the holy calm that God is. Christ's love permits no space for anything opposed to inward heavenly tranquility. He urges his disciples to reject heart disruptions. Those intimate with Christ experience Christ's own peace. Lovers are privy to hearing the bridegroom's comforting words, My peace I give to you. It is interesting to note that the waters at the pool of Bethesda were said to have been moved by an angel. An angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. The word that is used for stirred is the same word that Jesus uses to describe the inner agitation he commands them to prohibit. Do not let your hearts be stirred. A quiet lake can reflect the image of what is above it, while the ocean's foam reflects nothing. The image of God in us is dependent upon a heart stilled upon him. Those whose hearts are tossed and troubled display nothing of the holy calm that God is. Matthew Henry captures the image well. Be not so troubled as to be put in a hurry and confusion, like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, or in another place, Keep possession of your own souls when you can keep possession of nothing else. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust in me also. Trust and trouble are mutually exclusive. As water does not have power over oil, so trouble cannot overpower those who trust. Never be in a hurry. Do everything quietly and in a calm spirit. Do not lose your inner peace for anything whatsoever, even if your whole world seems upset. For what is anything in life compared to peace in your soul? I once met an amazing preacher who was old enough to have met many of my preaching heroes. Leonard Ravenhill, Lloyd-Jones, G. Campbell Morgan and others. I was intrigued, asking many questions. What was Ravenhill like? Very quiet, selective with his words, he answered. And Morgan? He once refused to continue preaching until the windows were opened because he felt it to be too stuffy in the room. I laughed at the humanity of these precious saints whose voices, though dead, still speak. I culminated my questions with the question most dear to my heart. Which, of all those you have met, uniquely emanated the presence of God? His answer was, Without a doubt, Corrie ten Boom. My heart was touched with such a definitive answer. From this woman who stood before God, these simple words teach volumes. If you look at the world you'll be distressed. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. The presence of God in her life and her attention to God were inseparable. Notice how King David, under holy inspiration, connects the same two realities— why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. He turned his attention to the hope in God and received the help of his presence, literally the rescue of his presence. The essential reality of salvation is being saved from a life apart from God and the comfort and rest that God is. John Calvin writes with striking clarity on the matter, All 
all confess that we ought to believe in God. This is a fixed axiom to which all subscribe without controversy. Yet there is hardly one in a hundred who really believes it. Not so much because the sheer majesty of God is too distant from us, but because Satan puts every kind of cloud between us and God, so as to keep us from the vision of God. So it is that our faith vanishes even while it seeks our God in his heavenly glory and inaccessible light. Our own flesh comes up spontaneously with a thousand fancies which turn us away from a right apprehension of God. Christ, therefore, presents himself to us as the proper object of our faith. If we direct our faith to him, it will immediately find certainty and rest. He is Emmanuel, who responds within us to our inquiring faith. It is a basic article of our faith that if we do not wish to go around and around endlessly, we must direct our faith to Christ alone. Hence, Jesus does not say, believe in my things, my angels, my miracles, my wisdom. He, with certainty, states, believe in me. As the mariner finds his bearings looking to the sun, so must the Christian find his bearing by looking unto Christ. Even as seasickness is stayed by looking to the unchanging horizon, so the illnesses of life are stayed by looking to the unchanging Christ. The early understanding of John Christendom gives us similar comforts. All dangers shall pass you by, for faith in me and in my Father is more powerful than the things which come upon you, and will permit no evil thing to prevail against you. Because of the great goodness of such a promise, men who are swayed by the human darkness of unbelief continually question its validity. Such a grand promise is only a reality to those who experience the person of Christ, for nothing else can keep the sweet current of God's life flowing in and through us. Ryle speaks, Heart trouble is the commonest thing in the world. No rank or class or condition is exempt from it. No bars or bolts or locks can keep it out, partly from inward causes and partly from outward, partly from the body and partly from the mind, partly from what we love and partly from what we fear. The journey of life is full of trouble. Even the best of Christians have many bitter cups to drink between grace and glory. Even the holiest saints find the world a veil of tears. Faith in the Lord Jesus is the only sure medicine for troubled hearts. To believe more thoroughly, trust more entirely, rest more unreservedly, lay hold more firmly, lean back more completely. This is the prescription which our Master urges on the attention of all his disciples. Robert Murray McShane once wrote to a friend, If you need more rest, lean more. May the Spirit anoint your eyes to see him and soften your heart to lean on him. There is a learning that only comes from leaning. Just ask the disciple whom Jesus loved or the disciple who sought to gain the mystery through him. A dear friend of mine was speaking about the bride in Song of Solomon coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. And he remarked, If she is leaning on him, that means if he withdraws, she falls. What blessed dependence! We must remain in the sweet love exchange of fellowship with Christ, for there is nothing that can impart life and guard our hearts. The scriptures teach us, Above all else, guard your heart. You have stolen my heart, taken it from me. Keep it, Lord. It is safer with you than with me. Matthew Henry calls the heart the main fort. He says, Whatever you do, Keep trouble from this. 
He exhorts us to keep our minds quiet when everything else is unquiet. In direct contrast to a troubled heart, we have Jesus encouraging us to feel sure that what he is saying is true and to trust in the gracious person revealed in and through him and his words, the one who is the sovereign creator of the universe and merciful redeemer and faithful preserver of mankind. Jesus goes on to show us the words and realities in which he is a comfort to us, and also what he speaks to them to be a comfort. He comforts us with the fact that he is going to prepare a place for us that we might be with him forever. In Jesus' final prayer, he says to his Father, I desire that they may be with me. What great comforts are felt in the soul when we believe that his love has prepared for us an eternal dwelling with him in glory. The house itself is lasting. Our estate in it is not for a term of years, but a perpetuity. Here we are as in an inn. In heaven we shall gain a settlement. The disciples had quitted their houses to attend Christ, who had nowhere to lay his head, but the mansions in heaven will make them amends. It is impossible to count the waves in the ocean, so the billows of his love will crash over us for numberless ages in this place where he goes to prepare a place for us. Comfort of comforts. Eternity is sealed. Your love, the ocean, I walk into the sea. Raise the waves of your love, I let them bury me. He comforts us with the fact that he himself is our only way, truth, and life. If left to ourselves, we could never find the way. We could never hold the truth. We have no life in ourselves. Jesus is all of this for us. Comfort? More so. He is all in one. Forever more than enough for every human necessity. All is given to us upon his own spotless merit. Comfort everlasting. To know him is to know the way. To know him is to know the truth. To know him is to possess him as life. For he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. An early saint once wrote, He guides us in the way, instructs us in the truth, and animates us with his life. He comforts us with the fact that he will answer our prayers. Christ here assures them that they should be clothed with powers sufficient to bear them out. As Christ has all power, they, in his name, should have great power, both in heaven and on earth. As he is both comfort and comforter, he also gives comfort. Answered prayer is heaven's rubies, making the human soul rich. Its preciousness never fades. In the world to come, we shall recount his many faithfulnesses, much of which are direct answers to importunity. There are ministers unlettered, not of earth's great and wise, Yet mighty and unfettered, their eagle prayers arise. Free of the heavenly storehouse, for they hold the master key that opens all the fullness of God's great treasury. They bring the needs of others, and all things are their own, for their one grand claim is Jesus' name before their Father's throne. He comforts them with the fact that he will give them his spirit. Even a modicum of trouble in the heart is dissolved by this unfathomable gift of his own spirit. He who came upon the prophets of old and moved the apostles 
proceeds out of the very person of God to set up lodging in our very bodies. Let the world chain us hand and foot. We will sing of rivers in our bodies. All the kings of the world could lay their riches at our feet. With joy we will lift our eyes to the sky, and the Spirit shall lift us far above material things. By the Spirit we have life in heaven, even while on the earth. The golden streets in our heavenly dwelling teach us that gold belongs beneath our feet. O oh, happy band of pilgrims, lift your eyes to the skies, where such a light affliction shall win so great a prize. He comforts them with the fact that he will fellowship with them through the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit is a holy wonder and sign of divine pedigree. Yet, he is not a mere power within us. He is our experience of the person of Christ and our life source. As we hear him, we hear Christ. As we sense him, we sense Christ. For Paul believes in what he calls the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, he will not speak of himself. What he hears, that he will speak. Fellowship with Jesus, through God the Holy Spirit, is more than enough to satisfy the soul even in the depths of earthly despair. Reinhard Bonnke once told me, You can breathe the air of heaven even if you live at the gates of hell. Comfort? More so. God known, experienced. He comforts them with the fact that he will guide them through his spirit. As the spirit takes residence in the body and manifests fellowship with Christ, he also gives life direction. Many are crippled under the weight of the unknown. We have not only the promise of his indwelling to lessen our need for explanations, but fellowship to preoccupy us from such trivial things. And in addition, we have a promise of actual guiding directions and leading promptings of his will. Comfort? With such a guide, how is a troubled heart tolerable? We must have more confidence in his ability to lead than our ability to follow. He comforts them with the fact that he will give them his peace. If a man thinks that these wonderful realities themselves are unassociated with feelings, if a man thinks that they are to be relegated to mere facts, let him not ignore this next promise in God's compounding comfort gift. His peace. Are you interested in a peace that you cannot feel? Do you want a peace that is just confessed or positively claimed? Peace is not yet peace until it is experienced. Gratitude beyond expression should lift us up to sing. Hallelujah! He is wonderful, for he is not a promise merely claimed, but a promise experienced. He has not given merely comforting words and thoughts, but the reception of himself. Comfort? Yes. Felt. He expresses his joy. Peace is easier for men to claim than joy. Jesus speaks of real happiness. Grace itself is defined as joy. Gratification and that which causes pleasure. Jesus is not abandoning them to a life of mere survival. He is equipping them to conquer he isn't magnifying their trouble and encouraging them to stick it through. He forbids trouble in the heart because their understanding of what is coming so far exceeds what their human lives have ever known. With such wonderful Christ words, to fear and to be troubled is sin. For it is to think and to act in unbelief of these magnificent features of the covenant and person of the Lord. He came, 
his arm around me. I leaned upon his chest. I did not long to feel more strong. So sweet the childlike rest. Francis Ridley Havergal Precious listener, believe. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. For all that he is bestowing upon you makes a troubled heart a lack of trust in him. Believe what he has promised. Believe what he is giving. Believe him and receive him. Don't let his presence go unnoticed. He's come to take the curse away that separates us from the Most Holy One. You have been listening to Comfort in Chaos, Peace to the Troubled Soul, written by Eric Gilmore, copyright Sonship International, read by Chloe Elmore, produced by Chloe Voices. If you would like your audiobook produced by Chloe Voices, please get in touch through the link below.